Um, so I'm going to, maybe this paper should have come up at the beginning, because I'm going to talk, do a little bit of a sort of literature review type thing about empty spaces in um, towns and how archaeologists have, uh, have addressed them uh, and um, talk a little bit about the concept of non-place. Um, this isn't a medieval empty space, uh, it's a modern empty space. Um, it's the kind of thing that I'm, I sort of imagine when I think about a, a sort of decaying um, empty space that no one quite knows what to do with. This is an abandoned or an old uh, naval um, facility in uh, southern England. So, firstly, what do we mean by place? So this is taken from OJ, um, and he talks about the anthropological place. So he sees places as being defined relationally. So places don't exist on their own, they only be exist because um, things, are, uh, things and people are having relationships with spaces. Um, and they gain their sort of human element because they're concerned with identity. Particular types of place become associated with the formation and performance of different types of identity. So he, ter he defines the anthropological place as a concrete symbolic construction of space. The non-place he sees as being a product of supermodernity, um, and that's one of the reasons why I was quite interested in exploring the concept. Um, so, is it something which is really you know, hyper-modern? It only relates to the you know the late twentieth, twenty-first century, or is it another term uh, like the Anthropocene, which talks about all the you know the twentieth and twenty-first century, but you know humans have been impacting uh, for much longer than that. Um, he also sees the archetypal form as being the traveller's space. So I mentioned earlier, he talked about airports, motorway service stations, places which exist out of necessity but are somehow removed from society. Um, and you get that feeling in particular uh, in motorway service stations if you go in from the, the back entrance where the coaches park because you sort of go through these sort of dark tunnels and things before you go into the bit where all the restaurants are. Um, so, how can we relate this to the Middle Ages? Because if non-places are explicitly linked to supermodernity, then of course Middle Ages aren't supermodernity. Um, and I don't think we should necessarily be trying to create that direct line, but rather see, can we use this, this concept as a tool to think with, to think about how we can address places which are ambiguous, or spaces which are am ambiguous, that we can't necessarily pin a, a defined function on. And more importantly, what can we think, how can we use this concept to think about what these spaces actually do? <coughs> so how have archaeologists looked at empty spaces? Well, the first sort of substantial um, contribution I can find uh, is the paper from 1979 by Wilkins Schiffer, who looked at vacant lots in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, they took some students out to uh, record what was being found and, and done on these vacant lots. They found they had been used for travel, so people were using cut-throughs. Uh, refuse disposable, uh, refuse disposal, so both things that you know, casually throw your drinks can in there, but also more sort of structured sort of fly tipping and dumping. Storage of bulk goods, so people using them as kind of building yards and just dumping parts of bricks there to be used later. Play and recreation, uh, which is a broad um, term, so that's a <laughs> child play, but also uh, adult recreational activities. And of course, they were being used. Um, camping and um, as accommodation um, by homeless people as well. So we see that, yes, these are spaces in this instance which do seem to be associated with, with those sort of activities which happen at the margins. Uh, Jeff already uh, put up a um, uh, reference to Monica Smith's contribution in 2008, published in Archaeological Dialogues, which I think is the most substantive um, paper to discuss the concept of of empty spaces in um, towns. We did ask Monica to contribute to this session, but unfortunately she's doing field work in India. Um, so she sees that empty spaces are foci for particular types of activity which are performed at varying time scales. And that's an important point that um, places may be spaces may be empty for shorter or longer periods of time. Some spaces are consciously left empty, so you have buffer zones, or you have spaces which need to be used for particular tasks, like drying cloth, for example, or drying nets. Um, and she sees that actually these spaces are really important for urban communities, because there has to be an agreement that that space will stay empty. Because if you all want to dry your nets on there, and then someone goes and builds them, you can't dry your nets anymore. Um, so he, she sees um, that these empty spaces are shaped by urban authorities and by urban communities, and that they are inevitable within urban settlements, 
And critically, they are very flexible spaces within the urban landscape. And that's something uh, which I'll come back to. I mentioned as well that uh, my sort of awareness and interest in the concept of, of non-place had come from my reading of contemporary archaeology. Um, so particularly um, this paper by Shannon Dordy, um, where she's looking at post-industrial cities and ruin, the ruins within them. Um, so she argues that post-industrial cities are characterised by a cycle of ruination, buildings go out of use, fall into ruin, get regenerated, uh, and therefore cities are palimpsests of various forms of city building. Cities built at different times for different reasons by different people with different motivations. And ruined spaces somehow haunt these urban spaces. They have varying forms of longevity, whether that's in the way that they force the urban space to be divided up into plots, the way we see medieval plots continuing in urban landscapes, or the way that we get those sort of problematic ruins which you sort of have a heritage obligation to keep hold of and look after, but no one quite knows what to do with them, and they get used for all sorts of different things. And she therefore says that these ruins are kind of generative of particular forms of social life. So can we see urban empty spaces as non-places? I would suggest that in some cases they exist outside of the symbolically organised space of the city, uh, which would be Auger's definition of an anthropological place, and they are produced by urban life. They're certainly spaces which passed through and in a way are defined by their nothingness. But we've had quite a lot of discussion um, before the break about whether non-place was an appropriate term. And actually, the term place and non-place, I think, needs to be understood um, in a relative sense. So this is a quote from OJ. Place and non-place are rather like opposed polarities. The first is never completely erased, and the second never totally completed. They're like palimpsests on which a scrambled game of identity relations is ceaselessly rewritten. And this is the key point. A place is never just a non-place or just a place. It has an element of placeness or non-placeness. And now onto the smooth space bit, because I knew what you really wanted at five o'clock in a muggy afternoon um, in Barcelona was more French philosophy. <laughs> um, so um, my work is, is largely influenced at the moment by the writings of Deleuze and Guattari and their assemblage thought or assemblage theory. If you want to know more about it, then please buy my forthcoming book on the subject, and just in time for Christmas. And in very simple terms, they define the world as being formed of flows of energy, of matter, of people, of ideas, which pass through time and space and become entangled, and they territorialize or coalesce into entities. And historical actions um, and persistent structures code the way that these flows can move around. So you have rules and regulations, for example, which means certain types of behavior can happen and certain types of behavior can't. And therefore, this coding striates the space. So you have a smooth space where you have any number of infinite number of entanglements and connections happening, and a striated space where historical action, historical structures mean that uh, the outcomes are more limited. So just like a place can't just be a place or just be a non-place that exists on this kind of spectrum, so spaces cannot be entirely smooth or entirely striated, because an overly striated space would be too structured. You'd just be stuck in Groundhog Day, repeating yourself over and over again, and no, nothing would ever change. Obviously, the world isn't like that. And similarly, a smooth space would be so unstructured that every second would be different from the second that came before it, and there would be absolutely no persistence and continuity. So spaces are always going to be somewhat striated, but with different degrees of smoothness. And what's critical about these smoother spaces is that they are the spaces that offer opportunities for creativity and for change. And um, Ian Buchanan um, has drawn similarities between the idea of smooth space and the idea of non-place, particularly seeing smooth spaces and non-places as being these spaces of ambiguity and transience. So I would suggest that empty spaces are kind of an urban smooth space in physical they're defined by urban activities, they exist because the town or the city exists, but their role can be somewhat undefined, and they're places in which new forms of urban experience might emerge, those sort of socialities which Dordie talks about. So this is the context in which I'm talking about, uh, we've heard a little bit about it in the previous paper, the late 14th and early 15th century, the period of the Black Death and Recession, where we get this 
uh, what historians have identified as this period of urban decline, so towns getting smaller and poorer, and urban decay of um, urban fabric falling apart. But as individual case studies have emerged, we found that this picture is far too simplistic. My own work looking at archaeological sites from southern England shows that really we get a mixed picture. Some towns are prospering, others aren't doing so well. It's clearly a period of adjustment in which what it was to be urban changed. And um, we can see changes to the urban landscape which created new empty spaces. And what I'm interested in is what can these new empty spaces tell us about these new forms of urbanity? So I've got three very rapid examples um, which may or may not be considered non-places. So the first is the site at Cookie Lane in the major port of Southampton, which was an area of mercantile housing in the 13th century, very high status area, um, very um, rich in imported pottery. In the 14th century, after the French raid in 1338, when new defences were um, uh, built, which cut this site off from the waterfront, and fire also destroyed buildings in an unrelated event, um, this area reverted to gardens. We've heard about gardens already. Um, so gardens emerged in this area, I think, out of a mixing of coding or striating and smoothing. So this was a land in the town which was possessed by a major institution, God's House Hospital. It was acted on by all sorts of different processes and actors, royal and urban authorities, in the construction of new defences. But it wasn't an area which seemingly left to become vacant and overgrown, which would be a, a non-place in the true sense. Um, and we're seeing historical tenement boundaries persisting. So I think this place shows how empty spaces are created out of the urban processes, um, that pro and that the processes of decline and decay created new opportunities, new spaces for urban horticulture, changing potentially urban rural relations, um, potentially uh, being really important for understanding the transition. Now, I don't think that this garden is a non-place. Um, but it's demonstrative of an urban space as a process of smoothing integration and that relational construction of space and place which OJ talks about. The second site, in a way, is similar to Jeff's open public space. It's another port, uh, Shore and by Sea, uh, in Sussex, close to Brighton, on the south coast of England. Uh, and this is the rope tackle site, which is an empty space at the edge of town, close to the waterfront. Um, as you can see from the site drawings, there's not an awful lot going on there. Um, there are dumps of 13th and 14th century domestic waste. Uh, there's also evidence that this area was used for range activities such as boat building and fish processing. So this is a space which existed outside of the urban, uh, the sort of formal urban landscape, but was essential to the performance of urban life. We've got ephemeral evidence here for periodic everyday activities, um, and space which is being made significant through that activities and through the imposition of structure. So this is one of those spaces which again is generating, it's generating, um, it, it's, it's generating structure, it's generating sociality, it appears to be an empty space, it's an important <coughs> mediator in urban life, it's one of those spaces which Monica Smith identifies as, as a space of um, consensus building. And the third example is the Castle Bailey at Guildford Castle in Surrey. So this is Guildford Castle Keep. Um, it was a royal castle and palace. It went out of use in the 14th century. And the Castle Bailey excavations have shown was largely kept clear of, um, sort of waste. And in a lot of cases, the Castle Bailey gets used as a sort of dumping ground. So again, maybe we've got a bit of that consensus building going on here because what we have is evidence for the use of this area um, for drying cloth. Um, possibly related to the intensification of textile manufacture. So here, the ruins of the castle, the empty space was adopted for particular activities, and that lack of royal interest caused this previously heavily regulated space to become smooth, it lost that symbolic power, it became a transient and ephemeral space in which new forms of urban spatiality could emerge. So, We've got Cookie Lane where striations persisted. It's not a non place as such, but empty space emerged out of the processes. At the road tackle site in Shoreham, we've got um, a peripheral empty space which was engaged with periodically. It seems to be smooth but becomes um, striated. It does seem to be ambiguous, so maybe at some times it had that sort of element of non placeness. And then Guildford Castle was once a symbol of royal power. That was lost. Political and economic change acted upon the space. Uh, it found a new use, it became more ephemeral, and maybe falls somewhere between these two examples. So I think that the 
The idea of the non-place is potentially useful to us for understanding the medieval period, but the medieval non-places are necessarily different to those of supermodernity, which Ojo talks about. We do see ambiguous and empty spaces, but these clearly played an important role in urban life. Also, those models of decay and decline are far too simplistic. We, rather than just saying spaces became empty in towns, we need to understand what the implication of that emptiness was. And I guess there's also scope for thinking about this in terms of other contexts, like the decline of urban towns. Um, so, um, space, I think it's useful to think of as a process this process of smoothing and striating, and the idea of the non-place, I think, is really helpful for us to think about what persists and why it persists, but isn't necessarily a concept which we can just lift straight out of um, anthropological theory and drop into the Middle Ages. 